Holy Father in heaven, blessed be thy holy name, O Lord. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. In your word we are told that the words that you speak are spirit and life. Lord in heaven, I have no words to speak that is spirit and life, but I pray that you put your words in my mouth that it may be spirit and life to all who would listen. We ask, Father, please grant to us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that as we listen, we may be drawn nearer to you, that we shall be transformed into your image. Do this and take the glory. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Conflict and Courage February 13 Entertaining Strangers Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 God conferred great honor upon Abraham. Angels of heaven walked and talked with him as friend with friend. When judgments were about to be visited upon Sodom, the fact was not hidden from him, and he became an intercessor with God for sinners. His interview with the angels presents also a beautiful example of hospitality. In the records of Genesis, we see the patriarch at the hot summer noontide, resting in his tent door under the shadow of the oaks of Mamre. Three travelers are passing, are passing near. They make no appeal for hospitality, solicit no favor. But Abraham does not permit them to go on their way unrefreshed. He is a man full of years, a man of dignity and wealth, one highly honored and accustomed to command. Yet, on seeing these strangers, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Addressing the leader, he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant. Genesis chapter 18, verse 2 and 3. With his own hands, he brought water that they might wash the dust of travel from their feet. He himself selected their food. While they were at rest under the cooling shade, Sarah his wife made ready for their entertainment, and Abraham stood respectfully beside them while they partook of his hospitality. This kindness he showed them simply as wayfarers, passing strangers who might never come his way again. But the entertainment over, his guests stood revealed. He had ministered not only to heavenly angels but to their glorious commander his creator, redeemer, and king. And to Abraham, the councils of heaven were opened and he was called the friend of God. The privilege granted Abraham and Lot is not denied to us. By showing hospitality to God's children, we too may receive his angels into our dwellings. Even in our day, Angels in human form enter the homes of men and are entertained by them, and Christians who live in the light of God's countenance are always accompanied by unseen angels, and these holy beings leave behind them a blessing in our homes. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is Entertaining Strangers and what a devotion this is. Wonderful, wonderful subjects that we have today. 
our key text is taken from the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 and it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This devotion is looking at the story in the book of Genesis chapter 18, reading from verse 1 down to verse 8, where Abraham had that encounter with God. Now we are examining the life of this wonderful man, Abraham, who is called the father of faith and also called the friend of God. And we have seen many, many wonderful things in his life, many interesting things. His is a character worthy of emulation that we should really study so that we can be inspired to holy emulation. Today, we look at the life of Abraham when, as we understand the circumstances surrounding this matter, he met these strangers on the land, in his, in his, in his environment. Now, what makes this story so remarkable is when we understand who we are talking about here, Abraham. So who is Abraham at this time? As we look at his life, we see that this is a man who is humble and we'll see the humility of Abraham displayed in his relation with these strangers. Abraham is the man whom the Lord said of him, in blessing I will bless thee and I will multiply your seed so that if a man can count the sand on the seashore, then they will be able to number your seed in the earth. It is this same man who the Bible told us that he returned from Egypt, rich in cattle, in gold and silver. He is not rich in just mere money, but he is a man who is rich in gold and silver and in cattle. He is a man who has you would say an organization that employs over a thousand people. Abraham had over a thousand souls with him. At the time, he took more than 300 of them that were from his house to go for the war to rescue Lot. And these over 300 souls were born in his household. Those are not the ones that he sort of employed. They were born in his household. Now, when we understand the estate, the dignity, the affluence of this man, and the fact that he is one accustomed to commanding people, remember the centurion in Matthew chapter 8 who told Jesus, I am a man under authority, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and I say to this one, Come, and he cometh, and I say to this soldier, Do this, and he doeth it. You see, Abraham was a man like that, a man under authority. Abraham was this kind of person. The centurion had soldiers under him, so did Abraham. And Abraham had over a thousand people under him. And he's accustomed to giving orders and telling people go and do this and go and do that. He's accustomed to it. He's not the one who takes things to do for himself. He gives orders here and there. People take care of almost everything for Abraham. This is the man we are talking about here. Now, this man. Abraham, in the hot summer noontide sitting under a tree, sees three people he does not know, strangers who does not call for his attention. They never asked him for any favor, but there they go passing by. This, as you look at the story, it looks like a fairy tale. It almost looks like, did Abraham know that these people were angels? When you look at it, you feel like maybe he knew they were angels. That's why he did what he did. But no, Abraham did not know. They were strangers to Abraham. He was just calling strangers to come to his home and take some rest. And that's why it looks as if it was planned, but it wasn't planned. So what is it that made Abraham to just go and meet them and say to them, not just talking to them, but bowing down to them, bowing down to these strangers and pleaded that they stop by and that they wash their legs and have some water and just that he would take care of them. What is the privilege in people stopping by and then you helping them? Now, this is a lesson for us to learn. We need to change our perception. Hospitality is a privilege. We shouldn't look at it as a burden. But when we are giving, it is a privilege. It is not the receiving of hospitality that the Bible says is blessed, but rather the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
This is most likely the perception of Abraham. He is a kind of person who felt and thought and understood that service and being of service to people is the higher duty than actually being served. This is why Abraham literally begged to serve. Do you beg to serve or rather is it the other way around for you? And these people were strangers. He didn't make his own child or his family members. It's not his family members or his child that he's doing this for. He's doing it for strangers that they should stop by his house and he wanted to serve them. I mean, does Abraham get a kick out of serving people? Actually, that's what it looks like. Abraham, uh, it looks like he feels good about doing things like this. Do you feel good when you serve people or do you feel like you're just incurring losses? Maybe people come to your house and you've cooked some food and then you are thinking of how you are going to sustain yourself with this food for some days you've calculated everything do you feel good when you give it to others and then the food finishes before the time that you stipulated or you plan for it abraham is begging people strangers to help them they didn't see the need of help they didn't need it they didn't need the water but he just called them to give it to them he selected their food and then told his wife exactly what to prepare for them. Abraham and Sarah prepared for these people. It was an honor to him to be the ones who will prepare that food for them. Talk about hospitality. May the Lord change our perception so that we understand that it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many of us would feel happy to serve Jesus when we have him around us? Many of us will be happy. Oh, it's Jesus. Everybody will look at it as a privilege. Or when you have rich visitors in your home, many of us love to do this. We love to make that very big preparation for them because we look at them as highly honored guests. And maybe it is someone who is rich and affluent, but if it was someone who was poor, you may not necessarily see the wife going to prepare the food for, for them. They may not even serve them at all or they'll just tell a servant to do the work. But when we have rich guests in the home, you find out that there's a hustle and bustle in the home. People are moving helter-skelter. You see your parents buying stuff that you know there's something strange happening here. You can tell that something is coming. And you know that the visitor who is coming is, at least by the actions of your parents, is not considered as a small person, but a person of high dignity. And then they tell the daughter and the child, go here, do this and do that. The mother herself, maybe she's the one who comes to even serve the food while the man is always very hospitable towards them. You see, Abraham did not do this for rich guests. He did it for strangers. Let that be a lesson to humble us. Favoritism and partiality is what the Bible condemns in the book of James chapter 2. We are told in James chapter 2 reading from verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you assembly a man with a gold ring, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Our hospitality should not be partial. We shouldn't prepare hospitality in a certain way for the rich. Abraham will do the same thing for strangers and look at how he treated them and he did not know that what he was doing was for the Lord. This is a privilege and I know that many of us would prefer the Lord comes to our own home so that we can serve him. Do you want to serve the Lord with your food? Do you want to take care of him? We read in our devotion, Conflict and Courage, page 50, paragraph 4, it says, The privilege granted 
Abraham, and Lot is not denied to us. By showing hospitality to God's children, we too may receive his angels into our dwellings. Even in our day, angels in human form enter the homes of men and are entertained by them. And Christians who live in the sight, in the light of God's countenance, are always accompanied by unseen angels. And these holy beings leave behind them a blessing in our homes. End of quote. So do you want to serve angels? Do you want to serve the Lord? Serve your brother. Serve that your brother, then you are serving the Lord. This is the reason why in the book of Matthew chapter 25 verse 32 down to verse 40, speaking about those whom Jesus considered that would be in his kingdom and he called them the sheep who he would take to his right side. He said, and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was unhungered and you gave me meat i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in naked and ye clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison and you came unto me then shall the righteous answer him saying lord when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or testy and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Amen. Do you understand that when you are doing it, these services to the children of God, and not just the children of God, just service to man, the Lord looks at it as if you are serving him. We don't need Jesus himself coming here now for us to serve him. If you neglect your brethren, that stranger in your gate, that that poor brethren, if you neglect them, it is Jesus you are neglecting. And if you help and serve them hospitably, in the same manner that Abraham did it, Abraham didn't do it as if he was lording over them. He bent down and bowed to them, begging to serve. And after he was done serving them food, Abraham stood by their side while they sat down. Today, men are like kings in their homes. This culture of Abraham, we need to learn it. When strangers are in the home, it is not for the man to come out and like uh, examine them and look at them up and down and then knowing that, oh, you've come to the king's home and then he has his own seat and then seated and the people are looking like, oh, this is another man's house. Abraham was not like that. Abraham treated them like kings and he treated himself like a servant standing by their side. Why will Abraham do this? They were just mere strangers. When you look at it from the perspective that they were that it was God who came to meet him with the angels, you may miss the point, but don't look at it that way. In the mind of Abraham, this was not God. As far as Abraham was concerned, these were just mere strangers. We need to learn the lesson that we should be hospitable. The lesson that it is more blessed to give or to serve than to be served or than to receive. Our Lord Jesus also taught this same lesson throughout his life when he was on the earth. He kept on serving and serving and for him it was more blessed to serve to the point that he knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Our Lord Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth, knelt down to wash his disciples' dirty feet. That is a servant's work. That is not the work of a king. That is not the work of a lord. But the Lord will have us know that if any man will be great in his kingdom, then he must serve. It is not he who lords it over his brethren that is the uh, child of God, but he that serves. How did Abraham understand this lesson? I don't know. I don't know. There was no Bible for him to read. There was no example of Abraham for him to copy. But Abraham had learned this and service of service to others not because he was poor not because he was trying to get something from them but just mere kindness to show to people was in abraham's culture 
it was something he had developed and he taught it to Lot so that when these angels still went to Sodom, Lot saw them and did exactly the same thing. This is a lesson that we should learn. But when we look at the book of uh, Matthew chapter 24, reading I think verse 10, this is what is happening to us today. Matthew 24 verse 10 says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Today people are afraid. Stories are told. Since I was young, they've been saying the story till today. They're still saying the story, though I have never seen it, that you shouldn't uh, help people. If you give money to beggars, oh, you will disappear. All those kind of superstitious stuff to make us become hardened. Yes, it is true that there's a lot going on in our world today that is terrible. People try to help and it backfires on them. But what do we do about that? We'll get to that. But what does the Lord has to have, have to say about the blessings for those who will cultivate this character of Abraham, this character of serving, though you are rich, though you are affluent, though you are somebody of a high estate, that was how Abraham was, yet he served people that were nothing, served people that in his mind were just mere strangers, he served them. When you look at the state of Abraham, he wasn't a poor person. The fact that he was rich makes this thing a humbling experience. We don't even have the wealth of Abraham, yet we find it hard to serve others. We don't even have just a sliver of what Abraham had. Abraham was rich in silver and gold and cattle. We just have mere papers, money. Some of us don't even have the money at all, yet our pride doesn't allow us to serve others. But look at this rich man, Abraham, rich in gold and silver and cattle, having many, many people employed under him. Yet, he didn't call any servant to serve these people. He did it himself. Neither did he just approach them and start to talk to them standing. He bowed to them. Neither did he sit down along with them while they were eating. He stood like a servant stands before their master. But yet, in his mind, they were mere strangers. This is just mind-blowing to understand. And I just pray that the Lord will transform my own mind and yours so that we can understand why Abraham did this and cultivate such a character. But the Lord has promises for us, which I would read for those who would want to practice this. Psalms chapter 41, reading from verse 1 to 3 says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou will make all his bed in his sickness. Amen. Another promise in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor, lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given, will he pay him again. The Lord promises us that when we have pity on the poor, he will bless us. But then having pity on the poor is even easier to do than what Abraham did, giving to strangers and welcoming them. Like I said, because of what we read in the book of Matthew chapter 24 reading actually it's from verse 11 to 13 it says and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved are we to allow the abounding iniquity to allow our love or to make our love to wax cold is it you that this prophecy was written for that because iniquity will abound your love will wax cold many christians are the ones being referred to here whose love will wax cold. So, we need to ensure that this prophecy is not going to be fulfilled in our lives because while there is a prophecy here saying that because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold, there is still the prophecy that the children of God will, not, will, will always entertain strangers. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 there said it, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. So, which are you going to do? Are you going to make the iniquity abounding to make your love to wax cold or are you going to follow the instruction in hebrews 13 verse 2 that says don't be forgetful to entertain strangers you need to do this by faith yes it is true that there is a lot going on around us that will discourage you from doing good and even when you do good people can can use it against you and you will incur losses but remember that the lord searches your heart and understands why you are doing what you are doing 
and he says he will repay. I want to read something now from Testimonies, Volume Two, starting from verse page um, from 20, page twenty seven, explaining to us the mindset and why we should do this. And it is a test from the Lord. God tests us with these things. It says, "Years ago, I was shown that God's people will be tested upon this point of making homes for the homeless." that there will be many without homes in consequence of their believing the truth. Opposition and persecution will deprive believers of their homes, and it was the duty of those who had homes to open a wide door to those who had not. I have been shown more recently that God will specially test his professed people in reference to this matter. Christ for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. He made a sacrifice that he might provide a home for pilgrims and strangers in the world seeking for a better country, even an heavenly. Shall those who are subjects of his grace, who are expecting to be heirs of immortality, refuse or even feel reluctant to share their homes with the homeless and needy? Shall we who are disciples of Jesus refuse strangers and entrance to our doors because they can claim no acquaintance with the inmates? End of quote. I'll continue the reading. That last question now. Are we going to say people should not come to my house because they don't know somebody that I know that knows somebody else that knows somebody that knows somebody? Do you have to know someone that knows someone that knows someone before you can allow someone into your home because that's usually is the case stranger is stranger they don't know someone that you know and they are complete strangers it is not because he's a friend of this my friend or that my relative and then the person recommended me that i'm staying in this so place and then because i know one person who recommended and then the person comes to my home we are talking of total strangers who have no acquaintance with the people in the home the Lord is talking to us that he will test us on this point to see whether we are worthy to be in his kingdom because we are also pilgrims and strangers and he is preparing a home for us. We strangers, the angels of God and heaven, all heaven is willing to accept these strangers and pilgrims into their own home. If we cannot accept strangers into our home, then why would you think that Jesus would accept you a stranger into his home. God is testing to see whether you are worthy. Will you show yourself worthy? I'll continue the reading now. There are some excuses people give as to why they cannot do this. Um, Going on now, it says in page 28, paragraph 1, Has the injunction of the apostle no force in this age? Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I am daily pained with exhibitions of selfishness among our people. There is an alarming absence of love and care for those who are entitled to it. Our Heavenly Father lays blessings disguised in our pathway, but some will not touch these for fear they will detract from their enjoyment. Angels are waiting to see. If we embrace opportunities within our reach of doing good, waiting to see if we will bless others, that they in turn may bless us. The Lord himself has made us to differ, some poor, some rich, some afflicted, that all may have an opportunity to develop character. The poor are purposely permitted to be thoughts of God, that we may be tested and proved and develop what is in our hearts. The Lord is testing us. I have heard many excuse themselves from inviting to their homes and hearts the saints of God. Why? I have nothing prepared. I have nothing cooked. They must go to some other place. And at that place, there may be some other excuse invented for not receiving those who need hospitality. And the feelings of the visitors are deeply grieved and they live with unpleasant impressions in regard to the hospitality of these professed brethren and sisters. If you have no bread, sister, imitate the case brought to view in the Bible. Go to your neighbor and say, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. 
We have not an example of this lack of bread ever being made an excuse to refuse entrance to an applicant. When Elijah came to the widow of Sarepta, she shared her morsel with the prophet of God, and he wrought a miracle and caused that in that act of making a home for his servant and sharing her morsel with him, she herself was sustained, and her life and that of her son preserved. Thus will it prove in the case of many, if they do this cheerfully for the glory of God. Hmm. Let's stop here now. The excuse that we give of lacking, the Lord is telling us that is not an excuse. Allow the people into your home and then ask. Take that example that Jesus gave. Go and ask and say, Lord, I have strangers in my home. Please give me so that I can give them. And the Lord will bless you. We miss so much blessings that comes to us disguised as work. It comes to us disguised as service. And in that service, it has been dropped a blessing for us to entertain that stranger. The Lord is using that as a, a disguise of a blessing to us. Just as it was for Abraham, it was a blessing for him. Blessing that came in disguise as a stranger. But Abraham did not miss it because he wasn't selfish. Selfishness is what stops us from entertaining strangers. Look at the woman of Zarepta, that, that widow. She had a bread and oil. There was famine and she was about to make this bread and oil and she said after they eat her, her son, she was going to die. The last one. And here it is that Elijah was asking, give it to me. She didn't know that angel was, Elijah was like an angel in the form of a man. And when she gave to Elijah, what happened? The Lord sustained her. And the Lord is saying to us, children of God around us today are representatives of Jesus, entertaining them and serving you are actually doing the same thing that Abraham and Lot did. What other excuse do people give? Some give excuse of their health. I will read now. Continuing the reading, it says, Some plead their poor health. They would love to do if they had strength. Such have so long shut themselves up to themselves and thought so much of their own poor feelings and talked so much of their sufferings, trials and afflictions that it is their present truth. They can think of no one but self however much others may be in need of sympathy and assistance. You who are suffering with poor health, there is a remedy for you. Isaiah chapter 58 says, If thou clothe the naked and bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, and deal thy bread to the hungry, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. End of quote. Doing good is an excellent remedy for disease. Those who engage in this work are invited to call upon God, and He has pledged Himself to answer them. Their souls shall be satisfied in drought, and they shall be like a watered garden whose waters fail not. Wake up, brethren and sisters. Do not be afraid of good works. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Do not wait to be told your duty. Open your eyes and see who are around you. Make yourselves acquainted with the helpless, afflicted, and needy. Hide not yourselves from them and seek not to shut out their needs. Who gives the proofs mentioned in James of possessing pure religion, untainted and selfishness or corruption? Who are anxious to do all in their power? And to aid in the great plan of salvation. You may say you have been taken in and have bestowed your means upon those unworthy of your charity and therefore have become discouraged in trying to help the needy. I present before you Jesus. He came to save fallen man, to bring salvation to his own nation, but they would not accept him. They treated his mercy with insult and contempt, and at length they put to death him who came for the purpose of giving them life. Did our Lord turn from the fallen race because of this? Now, though your efforts for good have been unsuccessful 99 times, and you received only insult, reproach, and hate, yet if if the hundredth time proves a success, and one soul is saved, oh, what a victory is achieved! One soul wrenched from Satan's grasp, one soul benefited, one soul encouraged. This will a thousand times repay you for all your efforts. To you, Jesus will say, 
Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Should we not gladly do all we can to imitate the life of our divine Lord? Many shrink at the idea of making a sacrifice for others' good. They are not willing to suffer for the sake of helping others. They flatter themselves that it is not required of them to disadvantage themselves for the benefit of others. To such we say, Jesus is our example. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, this long read we have just had is addressing all the reasons why people say we cannot help. Iniquity is abounding and the love of many is waxing cold. Because you have helped people in the past and they did not pay you well, it turned out wrong. They even did you evil. And then some people swear and say, I will never help people again. I've even seen people who because they, 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 they helped someone and they mark the name and they say, oh, anybody who has this name, I will never help the person again. Are you displaying the character of Jesus in doing that? Perhaps he could say the same about you because you have sinned against him several times even after he has helped you. Perhaps Jesus could say, oh, this person, because they have done this to me over and over again, I will not help them again. The way we treat others should be the way we want Jesus to treat us. Do you want Jesus to accept you into his home? Then accept people into your home. Even after they have done you wrong several times, continue to do good. Don't be weary in well-doing. The 100th time, if it is after 100 times you see the result, that 100th time can wipe out all the losses that you have had from the other 99. One soul saved is worth more than the whole world. And whatever resources you have put that you may have lost before, if you have put so much resources and you save just one, it is worth it. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us not allow iniquity to make our love to wax cold. The Lord will test us, remember? Perhaps you helped people before and it didn't turn out fine. I know a friend last year or two who was who tried to assist someone, came to church, said he needed help. Oh, I'm a Muslim. I ran away from Suzu place telling stories. And you don't need to tell people are telling lies. If you cannot find out the lie, then don't put it there and then just mistrust and you, got, you start to say, I refuse to help him because I don't trust that his story was true. If you cannot verify that the story is not true, it may make you look stupid. But still rend, render the assistance. Give the help that is needed. This friend I'm talking of, what happened to him at the end of the day? After rendering the help, the next morning he told the, other, the, the, the stranger in his home, he told him, I'm going somewhere. And then he went where he was going to for a while. Came back home and met his door locked. On opening it, what did he see? That stranger had stolen a lot of his things and ran away with it. What should he do? Never help people again? No, that's not what he should do. Let us not be weary in well-doing. That is just an example of how we too have treated Jesus. He also brought us into closeness with him. And in bringing us to closeness with him, we have also harmed him. But yet he doesn't say to us that he will not help us again. To such who are saying, I have helped people and it turned out well, I will not do it again. To such, we would say, Jesus is our example. May the Lord give us the grace. We understand the difficulty of all of this. That's why we pray that God will give us the grace to transform our minds, to see things the right in the right perspective, that it is more blessed to give than to receive, and hold on by faith to the promises of the Lord to those who will do this. Amen. Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we ask that you will transform our hearts and give us the right perception. Forgive us for the times that we have failed to entertain strangers or that we have allowed iniquity to make our love to wax cold and refuse to do good to people. Please, Lord, now we pray, transform us. When we are tested to make homes for the, the homeless, to give to the poor, please, Lord, help us not to be selfish but to trust in you that you will provide for us. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.